Hello everyone, so welcome. This is our first electrochemical colloquium of this fall semester. So if you're new to our colloquium and uh, want to see the previous speakers, please check out our YouTube channel. We have all, all the talks and all the speakers there. Today we're discussing bioelectrocatalytic reaction and um, how to study them in real experiments. So, as you know, the job of a catalyst is to lower the kinetic barrier for a specific chemical reaction. And there are many, many different catalysts out there. Many of us study them. But the most efficient ones are the enzymes. These are complex biomolecules that are so perfectly tuned that in some cases you can make the reaction barriers almost negligible. However, using these unusual properties in enzymes, in real electrochemical experiments can be very challenging. And this is because in this case, we would have to combine the complexity of biomolecules with the complexity of electrochemistry itself. So we have sort of a doubled complexity. And as a result, the fundamental studies and theoretical assessment of bioelectrochemical systems can become immensely difficult and challenging. So today we're discussing how biocatalysis can be interfaced with electrochemistry and how we can gain that fundamental insight into such systems, so as much as we can, at least. Our speaker, um, Professor Shelley Mintier, is a leading expert in bioelectrochemistry, analytical chemistry, and organic electrochemistry. Shelley received her PhD at the University of Iowa, and then from the year of 2000 till 2011, she had been a professor of chemistry and biochemical engineering at St. Louis University. And since 2011, she's a professor at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Utah. So, Shilly, we're really happy to have this opportunity to host you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And now the stage is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for, for the kind invitation. I think of, ah, now it sounds better. Yes. Good. Um, thank you so much um, for the kind invitation um, to come present. I, I think these um, colloquiums are a, an excellent opportunity um, to um, kind of uh, learn new areas of electrochemistry and electrochemistry is very, very um, diverse. So. Um, so, so Andrew had asked me to speak about bioelectric chemistry. Um, and so I am going to choose to speak um, primarily on bioelectric catalysis um, because that is, is what I do. Um, but I thought I'd give you sort of a short introduction um, to common areas of bioelectric chemistry um, before we get started. Um, and really, before we um, get started on explaining things, I think it's super important um, to always um, acknowledge that uh, bioelectric chemists wouldn't be where they are today um, if they weren't standing on the shoulders of, of giants in the field. So um, if Harry Gray had never studied protein electrochemistry, we'd have a lot of trouble um, trying to do the bioelectric catalysis that we do today. If Adam Heller um, had not you know, designed kind of next generation immobilized mediator systems, we would struggle. Um, and then people like Mark Whiteman um, in the nano, or sorry, the neuroelectrochemistry um, field um, sort of were critical um, to getting us to those next stages um, so that we can actually um, study um, neurotransmission um, as effectively and efficiently as possible. So if we look at bioelectrochemistry as a whole, um, there's a lot of different um, sort of, you know, subfields of bioelectrochemistry. Um, and I'm going to talk about a number of those sort of briefly, um, because they involve putting a biocatalyst down on an electrode surface. Um, so sort of uh, all the areas in red there, Hold on just a second. Let me turn my laser pointer on. Um, all the areas in red uh, are areas uh, where uh, we're putting a biocatalyst uh, down on an electrode surface. So, so I'll kind of cover those, um, but I didn't want to um, be the speaker who talks about bioelectric chemistry and doesn't talk about neuroelectric chemistry um, because this is a huge field. Um, it's not a field that I work in, um, but it, it's a very huge field um, that has made tremendous contributions um, over the last um, 20 to 30 years in both in vivo 
analysis as well as single neuron analysis to try to understand uh, sort of neurotransmission, try to understand um, disease states, um, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, and so they have developed a number of electrode structures um, that are focused on um, detecting sometimes the neurotransmitter like dopamine or norepinephrine, sometimes looking at ions, uh, sometimes looking at things like um, nitric oxide. Um, so they have developed uh, sort of micron scale uh, electrodes, a lot of carbon fiber electrodes down to sort of nanoscale electrodes to be able to do these in vivo studies and these um, single neuron studies. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with all of this work um, because they're working in a really um, complicated environment. Um, so most of us um, who are, you know, fundamentally trying to understand things are, are working in a, a buffer environment. We're not working um, in a brain. Um, and so we don't have to sort of think about uh, nonspecific absorption. We don't have to think about everything else um, that is that is there um, and having that kind of um, selectivity. So so that field is really booming. Um, it's booming for a number of reasons. Part of it um, is, you know, as we went to nanoscale, we were able to, to, to do a lot more. And the other has been um, that uh, materials electrochemistry in this field um, has broadened um, to be able to look at all different types of carbon materials um, as electrodes um, and, and their performance. Um, so um, most neuroelectrochemistry is fast scan voltammetry. Um, so they have made a, a lot of um, headway in the electroanalytical side of things in terms of uh, improving the fast scan voltammetry um, techniques. But this is some work from Jill Benton that just shows you know, that you can make um, incredible improvements uh, by sort of changing um, what your electrode material is. Um, and, and there's a lot of work um, going on there. Uh, making electrodes that, you know, prevent passivation, making electrodes that give you selectivity, um, et cetera. So, um, so I just didn't want to talk about bioelectrochemistry and not um, say something about neuro, uh, neuroelectrochemistry, um, even though um, I, I don't personally um, do it. Um, so my research group um, and kind of um, the focus uh, of uh, a lot of uh, our work has been interfacing biocatalysts with electrode surfaces. Um, and you might say, well, you know, the, 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 there are many, many electrochemists uh, who think about interfacing a, a, a catalyst with an electrode surface. Um, and that's true. You, you look at people who are interfacing, um, say, platinum nanoparticle catalysts with electrode surfaces for fuel cell applications, uh, for electrolyzers, um, et cetera. So there's a lot of work in sort of metals and semiconductor catalysts and interfacing them with electrode surfaces. There's a little bit of work now. Um, we're starting to see more of it with people on the molecular uh, electrocatalysis world um, um, interfacing with the electrode and um, immobilizing their catalyst on the electrode uh, so that it is um is so that it's not sort of um, free in solution. But biocatalysis gives you an extra challenge. Um, and the extra challenge is that uh, your biocatalysts, whether those are proteins, uh, those are nucleic acids, those are whole living organisms, uh, they're insulators, they're not conductors. Uh, if you put a platinum nanoparticle down on an electrode surface, that platinum nanoparticle has many um, you know, active sites on the surface. Um, and you can conduct the electrons to from the electrode surface very easily because the whole particle itself is conductive. And that's not true with biocatalysts. And so we have to think about sort of different strategies um, for um, interfacing our biocatalysts with our electrode surface based on um, the individual um, sort of principles um, that, 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 we, um, that we have. Um, and, and so really we break those down typically into the first two categories I'm going to show you, so mediated electron transfer and direct electron transfer, but there are some other options that I'll talk about um, as well. Um, so if we have a, uh, we have a biocatalyst uh, that is catalyzing a redox um, reaction, uh, we can use mediated electron transfer um, to actually transfer the electrons to from the biocatalyst. This uh, redox active um, species needs to be a reversible species. Um, it needs to, uh, you know, thermodynamically be going downhill um, so, that, so that it can uh, mediate. Um, but this is an option. And this is usually the first um, option that we try. I think it's very rare, um, at least in my research group, for us to start trying to do direct electron transfer, not knowing if we can do mediated electron transfer. Medi 
mediated electron transfer tends to be the easier thing to do. Um, and, and so we tend to, to focus there um, first. Um, but if we're able to get mediated electron transfer, then oftentimes we would really like to do direct electron transfer where we orientate our catalyst where the active site is within tunneling distance of the electrode surface. Um, so to kind of have a measurable current um, that's you know 10 to 14 um, angstroms or less. Uh, and, and we want to you know get that catalytic active site to be within um, tunneling um, distance uh, and uh, to, to be able to sort of orientate it um, so that all of our catalytic, or as many as possible, all is never going to happen, uh, as many as possible of our active sites are within um, tunneling distance of the electrode surface. But there's a lot of restrictions that apply here because some proteins are very large, um, some, um, and so there's no way um, for you to have an active site that's sort of close to the surface of the protein that would be um, close to the electrode. If you're looking at a microorganism, you have may have a microorganism um, that doesn't have any membrane proteins in it that can help you do extracellular electron transfer and get electrons um, uh, um, uh, sort of through the membrane to the catalyst. Um, and, and so there's sort of a lot of restrictions associated with that. And I'm going to talk about a few of those uh, and, and kind of um, some, um, some issues uh, or um, sort of concerns in the field uh, associated with um, direct electron transfer. The final type of uh, sort of electron transfer um, it is relatively new in comparison um, to the other two. Um, it is uh, essentially a situation where you're going to um, add a domain. Sorry, I have my Zoom box in the wrong place here. Um, you're going to add a domain. Now I've turned off my laser pointer. Let's see if I can get this to work again. Uh, so you're going to um, add a domain, uh, most frequently this is kind of a, a heme moiety, um, to your biocatalyst uh, that will help um, to kind of um, make a, 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 a sort of wire, so to speak, um, to the electrode surface that will help you um, to um, to add domains that will shuttle electrons onto the electrode surface. Um, this is uh, frequently um, in proteins, this would be a, kind of a, a heme domain. Um, so Koji Sodi, uh, when he was in Japan, um, really sort of pioneered this field of interdomain um, electron transfer in terms of doing the enzyme engineering um, to be able um, to do this. There are other researchers um, that instead of um, putting a, a heme domain, um, may put a metal binding peptide to be able to bind a metal nanoparticle, um, but they're in some way um, sort of um, uh, tethering to their catalyst, uh, a sort of mechanism by which you can um, shuttle electrons um, in and out of the, the, the system. Um, now, before I go in and um, kind of talk about some examples of mediated and direct electron transfer, I, I would be remiss um, to not uh, sort of talk about protein film voltammetry. So um, I'm going to talk a lot about cyclic voltammetry, um, and I'm going to call my electrodes modified electrodes. Um, and that's kind of the, the community, the electroanalytical community um, that I um, personally grew up in. Um, but in other parts of the world, um, the same um, sort of field um, is referred to as protein film voltammetry, um, or at least a subset of the field um, uh, is referred to as protein film voltammetry. This is typically uh, the case where they're going to take a a, a electron material, oftentimes a, a, a carbon material, like a hi highly ordered pyrolytic graphite um, electrode, um, and they're going to um, adsorb their protein uh, or their enzyme um, to it uh, and, and do cyclic voltammetry. Um, but uh, that sort of, um, because they have that uh, sort of adsorbed layer of protein um, they refer to it as protein film voltammetry. So you'll see both in the literature where some people will refer to it as cyclic voltammetry, some people will refer to it as protein film voltammetry. Most of that um, is kind of historical associated with um, sort of where they where they come from um, in, in uh, their sort of um, scientific uh, evolution um, as to as to which they they refer to it. So I'm going to call it cyclic voltammetry, um, but but some of the stuff that I, I talk about today, um, others might call uh, protein film voltammetry. 
Um, I talked about uh, this sort of, you know, situation of, of having the protein um, within tunneling distance to be able to do direct electron transfer. This is an example here of ascorbate um, oxidase um, and showing that ascorbate oxidase can do direct electron transfer. But there are actually many proteins um, that have been shown to do um, direct electron transfer. Um, so a wide variety of multi-copper oxidases like lacase and bilirubin oxidase, uh, a number of um, heme-containing proteins, uh, so a, a number of um, different um, dehydrogenases. Um, but, you know, Andrew asked me to talk about, you know, things that were um, sort of challenges and issues um, in the field. Um, and so um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, sort of glucose oxidase. And um, glucose oxidase is uh, probably one of the most common enzymes um, that it is uh, interfaced to an electrode surface. Um, it is kind of um, the background of glucose biosensors. Uh, people have been immobilizing glucose oxidase on electrode surfaces for many, many decades. Um, and so there has always been this thought that, you know, we are going to move from mediated electron transfer to direct electron transfer. And if you look at the last 20 years, uh, you'll see a ton of papers claiming that glucose oxidase uh, does direct electron transfer. Um, and, and I think it's really important um, to point out um, that glucose oxidase is a big protein. Uh, it, it's a large protein that has a very varied active site um, and to get it to do um, direct electron transfer without doing sort of an interdomain electron transfer without uh, sort of modifications to the protein, um, et cetera, um, would be um, extremely um, difficult, uh, if not uh, impossible. Um, and so even though you see um, hundreds and hundreds of reports of glucose oxidase doing direct electron transfer, many of those uh, are not actually providing the um, analytical evidence that they are doing direct electron transfer. So I want to show you an example here. Um, that's just an example of, of what you see a lot in the in the literature. So you take an electrode um, surface uh, in the absence of glucose, um, and you look at its um, CV. You see a, a, a little bit of uh, electrochemistry associated with the the FAD and uh, um, the flavin um, in glucose oxidase, and then you add the catalyst. Uh, or sorry, you add the substrate, uh, uh, in this case, glucose, um, to that catalytic um, electrode, and you um, sort of see a, uh, a, a sort of more sigmoidal shape, or your, uh, your forward um, peak gets larger, your backward peak gets smaller. Um, so it looks like you have electrocatalysis occurring. Um, and you do indeed um, have something occurring on your electrode surface, um, but what is not, um, you know, discussed here is whether or not oxygen is present. Um, and so glucose, uh, glucose oxidase um, basically reacts glucose and oxygen. Um, and so, so, so there are a series of controls that really are critically important um, for people to do um, if they're trying to show glucose oxidase direct electron transfer. Um, this is the first one. You, you want to show that you see bioelectric catalysis, um, but you want to show that that's associated with the enzyme. Um, so you want to do a denatured glucose oxidase um, control experiment um, to make sure that the sort of denatured version of the protein uh, doesn't do the same um, chemistry. Um, and because we have this sort of oxygen um, um, uh, issue with glucose oxidase, we need to do this in the presence and absence of oxygen and make sure um, that we um, are, are seeing um, we're seeing the same response in the absence of, uh, of oxygen. Um, and so I just, you know, wanted to point that out um, because as we start to talk about direct electron transfer um, and I'll start to talk about, you know, individual proteins um, and their challenges, I think the big thing that you have to go forward with and always think about is sort of what are those controls? Um, and those control experiments are a bit different than they would be um, for a, a traditional catalyst like a platinum nanoparticle article, uh, because you have this sort of unique ability to denature or inactivate or inhibit uh, your protein um, to be able to make um, great controls. A lot of your proteins are oxygen dependent, and so you can um, use that oxygen dependency um, to tweak out and figure out sort of what, what is happening.
Um, so, so that's kind of uh, just something to, to, to think about, um, but I wanted to kind of put that into to the context of, if we look at glucose oxidase, which is the most commonly um, used um, protein in um, bioelectric catalysis, and it has been used for a wide variety of applications from energy to sensing, um, et cetera, um, there has been an evolution uh, or a, a series of generations uh, of uh, glucose oxidase um, bioelectrodes. Um, I will tell you, um, some people will listen to me talk and they're, they will say, oh, you're, you're opposed to glucose oxidase. Uh, I am not opposed to glucose oxidase. It is a wonderful protein. It is a rock solid protein. Um, so, you know, when I have a, a new student coming into the lab, it is a great protein for them to work with first um, because it is so rock solid um, and, and it is so easy to work with um, that, uh, that um, although, you know, we're interested in a wide variety of proteins, um, that, that is a a good place to start. Um, but if we look at glucose oxidase um, and the sort of generations of electrodes that people have made um, with glucose oxidase, the very first uh, sort of generation of uh, electrodes, um, and these were actually um, for biosensing applications for people looking at glucose testing um, for um, diabetic patients, uh, they basically looked at the chemistry that glucose oxidase does and says glucose um, oxidizes, or sorry, glucose oxidase oxidizes glucose to gluconolactone, simultaneously reducing oxygen to peroxide. And so those very first electrodes that had glucose oxidase immobilized on them, the electrochemical measurement was actually the depletion of oxygen. Um, so it wasn't directly sort of measuring the chemistry of, of the catalyst, but as the catalyst continued to consume the glucose, then the oxygen concentration, the dissolved oxygen concentration in the solution went down and uh, they would see an electrochemical signal for this. Obviously, this becomes complicated because you have significant variations in dissolved oxygen. Um, and if you don't have a very well-contained um, system, um, then your dissolved oxygen concentration may change with time um, uh, as well. And so the next generation was like, okay, dissolved oxygen is problematic because it's there in different concentrations all of the time. Instead, maybe we would look at the product. Peroxide is also electrochemically um, active. Um, and so the, the second generation of, of glucose oxidase um, bioelectrodes looked at that peroxide that was being um, generated. Um, this works really well in a lot of applications that are not uh, sort of biological or in vivo um, applications, um, but it does allow for sort of false positives from a lot of things um, that, that might be um, sort of biologically um, there, like acetaminophen. Um, so do you have a high glucose concentration um, or are you detecting um, that you took acetaminophen um, today? So, um, so that's really um, the inspiration then um, for the third and fourth generation, um, which are the mediated electron transfer uh, and the direct electron transfer um, system. So, so the field of uh, bioelectric catalysis uh, is actually huge um, and, and quite long. Um, but, but if we look at sort of where we are in the third generation and fourth generation, um, then we're just looking at a, a few decades um, instead of a, an extremely long time. Um, the third generation, those are our mediated electron transfer. I'm going to talk about a number of mediated electron um, transfer systems. And then that fourth generation, uh, those would be um, your direct electron transfer systems, if you can get direct electron transfer um, to work. And many proteins um, you know, that, that we work with, we've probably worked with uh, uh, definitely greater than 50 um, proteins um, or enzymes uh, in my lab um, in the last, you know, 22 um, years. Uh, and I would say, you know, um, less than 20% of them do direct electron transfer. Um, so not everything can do direct electron transfer, um, but it is um, sort of, you know, something that we would um, like to do um, for proteins that are capable of doing it. Um, when it comes to thinking about these two systems, uh, the, the first thing um, to think about um, is really um, why would you want to do direct electron transfer um, and not mediated electron transfer? Um, and direct electron transfer um, allows you to not have thermodynamic losses. Anytime you put a mediator in, um, you're going to have a thermodynamic um, loss associated with that. Um, and I'll show you a couple um, pictures of that. Um, and so 
when we think about mediators, we really have to think about that when we're choosing a mediator. So how do you choose a good mediator? You want the potential, you want to look at the potential of the mediator. Um, and, and obviously, you know, um, we need it to be a ther thermodynamically viable um, to do mediation, um, but we don't want to, to, to lose too much um, potential. So I have a figure here. This is um, thanks to a longtime um, collaborator uh, of mine, Plamen Atanasoff, uh, who's now um, at the University of California, um, Irvine. But if you look at uh, a glucose oxygen fuel cell, you can look at the thermodynamic anode potential, you can look at the thermodynamic cathode potential and say, you know, I should get this voltage associated with it. In reality, the, the enzyme catalyst, um, each enzyme catalyst uh, is going to do that reaction um, at a, a slightly different potential. So here, um, lactase and bilirubin oxidase um, do that um, really close to the thermodynamic um, potentials. Um, so, um, so Andrew was saying that, that you have sort of high efficiency um, for, for proteins. Um, and part of that is because many of them do do um, the, the chemistry without a lot of um, potential losses, but there always will be a potential um, loss associated um, with those, those catalysts. If we look at our anode enzymes, I have a whole series of glucose enzymes here um, that have different cofactors, whether those are NADH cofactors, FAD cofactors, or PQQ cofactors. And you can see that the potential of the reaction for glucose oxidation um, actually happens uh, at different potentials depending on the catalyst um, that you use. Um, and so if you were doing direct electron transfer, you're communicating directly with that catalyst. So whatever the potential of that catalyst is, um, is, is sort of uh, the potential of the chemistry um, that you're doing. Um, however, if we put a mediator in there, so say I'm using uh, glucose oxidase and I put a mediator in there, now the potential is gonna be driven by that mediator. Um, and so here I, I show, you know, kind of a 300 millivolt um, loss in potential associated with the mediator. That wouldn't be the best mediator that we would want to choose. We want to choose a mediator um, where our losses, we still have to have a driving force. So, so our mediator still has to be in this range, um, but we want to minimize those losses as much as possible um, so that uh, we, you know, in this case, we're, we're generating energy so we can be as energy efficient as, as possible. Um, and and convert chemical energy um, to electrical energy um, as efficiently um, as possible. Um, so when we're thinking about mediators, we've got to think about the potential of the enzyme. So um, some people will make the mistake of looking at the potential of the reaction. Um, and uh, it's not about the potential of the reaction, but it's about the potential of the enzyme. Um, so all of that early work um, from Harry Gray, um, determining um, potentials uh, of proteins on electrode surface, all of that is sort of helpful um, for us um, today um, to make that initial determination of the enzyme potential um, so that then we can look at mediators uh, and make sure that we have a driving force um, that, um, that uh, we are in the right um, potential um, range, but that we're not losing too much potential. So, so you know, ideally, can we be, uh, you know, 50 millivolts, 60 millivolts um, um, from that enzyme potential so that we don't lose a lot of um, potential. Um, so that's thinking about it uh, with your sort of physical chemistry um, hat on, uh, but we also have to think about it um, from uh, the biochemistry side of things. A lot of the mediators um, that, that we have tried to use um, over the years um, are actually inhibitors to enzymes. Um, and a lot of this comes from the fact that a lot of early mediators were organometallic complexes. Uh, a lot of um, sort of metal um, systems will inhibit um, proteins um, and, you know, cause a, a decrease uh, in the current response or maybe completely um, eliminate um, the current response. So we have to make sure our mediator um, is biocompatible. Um, that means it doesn't inhibit the enzyme. If it's a microorganism, it doesn't kill the microorganism or keep the microorganism from growing and reproducing. Um, and then uh, oftentimes we want those mediators, we want to immobilize them on electrode surfaces. Uh, so we want to, them to be able to, to self-exchange, uh, so do self-exchange based conduction. So as much of an outer sphere electron transfer as we can get is ideal. Um, 
And then obviously the mediator needs to be stable. So it needs to be um, reversible. Um, and we can think about the total number of, of turnovers. So if you really look at what an electrode looks like here in um, my dark blue, this is our electrode surface. We are gonna want to put some proteins down if we're in a mediated um, system. They don't need to be orientated in, in a monolayer on the electrode surface. They can be within a polymer, um, but we have to take a few things into account. We have to take into account that redox potential so we minimize our losses. We would like these mediators to do self-exchange-based conduction to the electrode surface. Um, and so that means that we are, are probably going to immobilize them um, in some way, maybe as a redox um, polymer. Um, we have to um, think about uh, how we can uh, maintain the 3D structure of the protein. Um, so keep the protein from non-specifically absorbing and denaturing um, on the electrode surface. Uh, oftentimes these polymers, we want to add crosslinkers to them, um, but we want to make sure that we add crosslinkers that still allow the protein to have some degrees of freedom um, so that it can still um, uh, it can still do catalysis. We want the polymer um, to you know be uh, be a polymer that allows for fast diffusion of substrate uh, or reactant into the uh, into the polymer and product out of the polymer. Um, so we work with a lot of um, hydrogels um, in that area. So um, so there's a number of variables that we think about um, each time um, we design um, electron structures. And um, so with that, uh, I'm kind of going to go back um, to um, talking about some, some individual um, systems uh, of interest other than glucose oxidase. Um, with that um, sort of, you know, keeping in mind um, that um, although we'd love to do direct electron transfer, there are a lot of times that um, we have to do mediated electron transfer. And every story I'm going to tell you is going to start with mediated electron transfer. Um, and if it's possible to do direct electron transfer, then I'll talk about um, how how we uh, how we've been able um, to do that or, or how we um, plan to do that. Um, just a reminder, there's a ton of applications of bioelectric catalysis. We're not going to focus um, so much um, on applications, um, but more um, fundamental um, design um, today. But the bioelectric catalysis um, that, that I'm going to talk about today is going to be divided in two parts. Uh, those that generate electricity, um, so we would call these fuel cells or batteries, and those that use electro, uh, um, electricity, um, and sort of these would be the electrolyzers. So this is just the difference between having a galvanic cell and an electrolytic cell. And so I'm going to start talking about galvanic cells um, because uh, my research group um, sort of started um, on the galvanic side of things, and then we've moved to the um, electrolytic um, side of things. Um, so uh, we'll um, We'll sort of change gears uh, sort of midpoint uh, in, in discussing those. Um, so the first systems I want to, to, to talk about are sort of interfacing um, enzymes with electrode surfaces for energy um, conversion, um, so, so for fuel cell applications. I, I think we're all sort of familiar with hydrogen oxygen um, fuel cell. Uh, and the fact um, that the platinum catalysts uh, that are typically um, at the anode are great at working with simple fuels, um, um, things like hydrogen, if we alloy them, um, things like methanol. But if we start to work with really complex fuels, um, you have a lot of challenges. Um, most heavy, uh, most precious metal um, catalysts don't easily break carbon-carbon bonds. Doesn't mean that they can't break carbon-carbon bonds, um, but in terms of uh, sort of atmospheric um, pressure, um, uh, sort of you know room temperature, um, and reasonable over potentials, uh, it's really hard to to, to break carbon-carbon bonds. Um, enzymes break carbon-carbon bonds um, quite well, um, and they can work with really complex, um, really um, complex um, substrates. Um, so. Um, the most common uh, of all of the sort of uh, biofuel cells um, in the literature um, are actually glucose uh, biofuel cells using glucose oxidase, so using that um, same enzyme. Um, this is uh, some early work. Um, associated with osmium-based redox polymers, um, and, and uh, there, there is a, a series of researchers, uh, both in the U.S. Um, and Europe, um, that have effectively used osmium-based um, uh, redox polymers um, at both the anode and the cathode of a fuel cell, um, so obviously two different osmium um, polymers that have two different um, potentials. One is uh, going to drive that glucose oxidation to gluco gluconolactone um, with the glucose oxidase, the other that would take a, a multi-copper oxidase like lactase or bilirubin oxidase um, and do oxygen reduction um, to water. 
Um, the literature, you know, th this work is coming out of the early um, 2000s, um, but, but this uh, sort of, you know, field um, has been around now um, well-established current densities are, are, are increasing um, as people take a more materials approach um, to making these electrodes um, and trying to improve the anode material, the redox polymer, um, the enzyme, uh, the sort of composite itself, uh, you know, adding nanomaterials, um, et cetera. So, um, so this is a is sort of a, a very healthy field um, that, um, that, is very useful for thinking about implantable um, devices or wearable devices. Um, so in the case of, you know, glucose being in the bloodstream, being in sweat, being in tears, uh, you can think about that glucose being consumed. Uh, in this case, you're just doing a two electron oxidation, glucose to gluconolactone, um, but you have an infinite, uh, essentially, uh, amount of uh, um, fuel that is coming um, and being um, produced. If you think about this more from the um, sort of um, energy storage and energy conversion um, situation, you would be like, okay, you got two electrons out of glucose, but you really want to get 24 electrons out of glucose. You really want to take glucose all the way to CO2 uh, and not, uh, you know, glucose to gluconolactone or um, uh, or a two electron um, process. And so this then becomes um, sort of super challenging um, to, to, to think about because uh, there is not one enzyme um, that can do glucose complete oxidation to CO2. Um, I always tell people, you know, what is the holy grail? The holy grail, um, if I was a biochemist um, who could design something, would be a single protein um, that could do 24 electron oxidation of glucose. Um, that really can't happen. Um, so I'm not a biochemist. Um, there's a, a possibility that, um, that that enzyme engineering um, is possible in ways that I don't know. Um, but everything um, that I have seen in terms of enzyme engineering, um, can we get um, dehydrogenases or what we call oxy oxidoreductase um, um, enzymes, enzymes that catalyze redox reactions to catalyze more than one redox reaction. We can. Um, so they can engineer promiscuity um, into, uh, into proteins um, to be able to do multi steps of the process. But in the case of something like glucose, you have to break many, many carbon, carbon bonds. Um, so you need lyases as well as oxido um, reductases and, and to get that in sort of one protein um, that would do all 24 electrons um, is just not feasible. And so if it's not feasible for you to um, engineer one protein to do the chemistry, uh, the redox chemistry um, that you want, um, then you have to think about um, cascades. Um, and in, in the um, 90s, uh, you saw the first cascades come out. So um, Tejas Palmore um, and um, uh, well, Tejas Palm Palmer, um, while she was a, a graduate student or postdoc, um, actually looked at enzyme cascades uh, for fuel cells. Um, and she looked at a, a simple cascade of taking um, three oxidoreductase um, enzymes, um, so alcohol dehydrogenase, aldehyde dehydrogenase, and formate dehydrogenase to do complete oxidation of methanol um, to CO2. Um, and she showed that she could actually get this sort of three enzyme um, cascade to work. Um, and so this works uh, in this case really well um, for systems where we don't have carbon-carbon bonds. Um, so, so we can make um, cascades where we do deep or complete oxidation um, so long as we don't have to break the carbon-carbon bond. Bond. But if we have to break the carbon-carbon bond, we have to put non-oxidoreductase um, enzymes um, into the system. And, and so that's one of the research areas um, that, um, that my group has been focused on in sort of whether or not um, we could actually look um, at metabolism, at the metabolic um, pathways of living organisms where they do break carbon-carbon bonds um, and do oxidation, uh, and whether or not um, we could um, sort of learn from them or mimic them on electrode surfaces um, so that we could do deeper complete oxidation of fuels. So if you take that glucose example, if you consume uh, a, a carbohydrate, your body can completely oxidize it. So, so glucose uh, actually feeds into the glycolytic pathway, which is um, one of the two most popular uh, metabolic pathways to produce pyruvate. 
pyruvate the, then goes into your mitochondria, goes through the Krebs cycle and gets completely oxidized to CO2. So complete oxidation and breaking carbon-carbon bonds can absolutely happen through metabolism. Um, and so we've spent quite a bit of time um, actually thinking about whether or not we can actually get things like the Krebs cycle, which is also called the citric acid cycle, to um, function on an electrode surface. And that means that uh, although the literature had put single proteins like pyruvate dehydrogenase down on the electrode surface, we need to put other dehydrogenases down that are gonna be our electron producing uh, enzymes, as well as lyases, synthases, kinases, um, et cetera. Um, so, so can we put a whole series of different um, proteins down um, and actually get complete or delete uh, um, deep oxidation. And so um, in this case, if you actually look at the citric acid cycle, unlike glucose oxidase that has this bound cofactor NA, or bound cofactor FAD, uh, it turns out um, that with most of your dehydrogenases of the Krebs cycle, they're uh, NAD or NADP dependent, um, which means that they um, actually have a cofactor that is not bound. That cofactor has to get to um, the catalyst, uh, it has to react, change its oxidation state, and it has to, to, to diffuse away. Um, so these are all proteins that cannot do direct electron transfer. They can only do mediated electron transfer because their cofactor factor isn't bound. Um, so you have to have that cofactor diffusing to the electrode surface um, and the, the, the change of redox state of that cofactor has to happen at the electrode surface. Um, so for all intents and purposes, you could think of these um, as all technically being mediated by the cofactor. So this NAD, NADP is actually your is actually a mediator in the system um, where it goes to the enzyme, it changes oxidation state, it goes to the electrode, changes oxidation state, and comes back. Um, unfortunately, NAD, um, NADP uh, electrochemistry um, is not good. Um, so it's not ideal um, in the forward or the reverse um, direction, um, depending on whether you're oxidizing or reducing. Um, and so you, you end up with this um, situation where you really need an additional catalyst there um, to be able to catalyze um, that mediator, uh, which is a cofactor. Um, and, and so in the case uh, of the data that I'm going to show you today, we use polymethylene green. Um, this is a, a, a phenothiazine. Um, there's a number of phenothiazines um, that have been studied um, as electrocatalysts uh, for cofactor um, regeneration. So Lo Gordon um, at Lund University basically pioneered this work um, and did a great deal uh, of work um, on the mediators or on the electrocatalysts on immobilizing them. Uh, into, um, in our case, a, a conducting polymer on the electrode surface. So, so we simply take a carbon paper electrode, we do cyclic voltammetry um, to um, form the conducting polymer. So we um, put our carbon paper in a solution of methylene green. We do cyclic voltammetry to, um, to polymerize that methylene green on the electrode surface. And then we uh, will add one or more of the um, enzymes of the, the, the Krebs cycle um, to see if we can actually get them to communicate with the electrode and do deep oxidation. Um, so in this case, I'm going to show you um, data as power curves. Um, and, and those power curves are for a full fuel cell, not just an anode. Um, so we have an anode and a cathode that's separated by a, a nafion separator. Um, so the back end of this looks just like a regular fuel cell. The front end we've changed um, to, um, to, to be a um, pyruvate anode um, with one or more enzymes. And so when we start this, we actually um, start with a fuel cell that just has pyruvate dehydrogenase, just has a single enzyme. Um, and you can see in pink um, that we have uh, a, a power curve there for, for the single enzyme. We then titrate additional dehydrogenases with, with their corresponding non-dehydrogenase um, enzymes. And you can see we expect the current to double. Uh, it goes up a little bit, but doesn't double. We add another dehydrogenase, it goes up a little bit, but doesn't triple. Add another one, it goes up, but doesn't quite um, quadruple. And it's not till we add this last enzyme, malate dehydrogenase, that we see this sort of huge increase um, in current. Um, and this is not surprising. Um, basically, if you look at any of the enzymes that we use, um, uh, and we put 
put them down on electrode surfaces. They are part of complex pathways. And complex pathways in biology have substrate and product inhibition. And so if you start just putting individual enzymes down, they won't behave the way that they behave in vivo. Um, so your current um, that you get out of them um, will not be as high because um, the, the reactants and products and intermediates um, can inhibit um, the, the individual um, enzymes. So, um, so that's kind of, you know, uh, a story um, kind of focused on the generate electricity um, side of bioelectrolysis. Now I'm going to show you a, a couple of examples on using electro, uh, electricity um, for, for electrosynthesis. Um, and so just to give you a little background of sort of why I care about this particular um, protein, um, a, a lot of us um, kind of know about the Haber-Bosch process um, and how important it was um, to produce the ammonia that feeds the world for the last hundred years. But if we actually look at the Haber-Bosch process, because it is a high temperature, high pressure process because we're not using um, sort of green or um, uh, very green um, hydrogen. It's a really high energy consumption process and it, uh, it is actually producing, responsible for producing uh, a lot of the global um, CO2 um, um, production. So electrochemists have been interested in sort of whether or not um, they can make catalysts to do nitrogen reduction to ammonia. So um, that's a challenging reaction. Breaking a nitrogen-nitrogen bond is a challenging reaction. Hence the reason um, that in Haber-Bosch, this is done at high temperature um, and high pressure. But as we started to see all of this literature and all of these people um, looking at different um, precious metal and, um, and transition metal um, catalysts um, that, that, that they're um, trying to use um, for nitrogen reduction to ammonia, we started realizing that this might be a situation where really um, biology can help us out. Um, so for millions of years, biology has evolved an enzyme called nitrogenase. Uh, it is the only enzyme that's known to reduce nitrogen to ammonia, but it does it at room temperature and atmospheric pressure. Um, so it's a great um, sort of, you know, protein in terms of uh, this chemistry that's really difficult to do with traditional um, catalysts it is something that we may be able to do um, with biocatalysts. Um, and so uh, Ross Milton, um, who is a uh, postdoc in my lab, um, is now uh, a faculty member at University of Geneva, um, was really excited about sort of whether or not um, we could use nitro nitrogenase as a catalyst. Unfortunately, it's really hard to work with. It's really hard to express and purify um, in its active form. Um, and so a special thanks goes out to Lance Seafelt um, because Lance Seafelt, uh, Utah State, really um, helped us out. Um, he had Ross come visit, um, showed Ross um, the intricacies uh, of actually um, producing um, the enzyme. Uh, it's also important to note that this enzyme is a promiscuous enzyme. Um, so it's also interesting to us because it doesn't just do nitrogen reduction to ammonia. It also does proton reduction. It also does CO2 reduction, azide reduction, um, et cetera. Um, and, and so from us, it was like, okay, this is a really interesting protein. It has this beautiful, um, you know, bioinorganic um, cofactor. Um, it's a complex protein because it has two parts to the protein and they have to come together and transfer electrons and go apart. Um, so it was a significant challenge um, for us uh, electrochemically. Uh, and so our, our first thought is, okay, if I want to interface this protein with the electrode surface, I really just need this catalytically active portion. Um, so I really just need the portion that does nitrogen reduction to ammonia. And then rather than having this uh, protein over here that um, transfers the electrons, I am going to use the electrode um, to do that. So uh, we always start with mediated electron transfer because it's always easier um, than direct electron transfer. And so we decided to immobilize our protein on the electrode surface, use cobaltocene, cobaltocinium. Um, as a reversible mediator because it had the right potential for that catalytically active portion. Um, and you can see here that if I have a, uh, a bovine serum, a non-enzyme um, um, control, then I see the reversible um, CV of cobaltocene, cobaltocinium. I see the sigmoidal bioelectrocatalysis of the enzyme. Uh, Lance was nice enough to give us a mutant that was supposed to be more active, and we uh, indeed um, see uh, a um, sort of more substantial biocatalytic um, peak or bio catalytic sigmoid associated with that. However, the thing that I have to point out here is all this was done in the absence of nitrogen. Um, and because this is a promiscuous enzyme, then that means that it can do proton reduction. Um, so this is basically showing that we could interface nitrogenase with the electric surface. Um, but with this cobaltocene cobaltocinium, um, it 
was not doing nitrogen reduction. It was doing proton reduction. We could add azide and nitrite, and it would do all these other promiscuous reactions. It would do CO2 reduction, but it wouldn't do nitrogen reduction. And so that meant that we kind of had to go back to the drawing board and we couldn't just put the catalytically active protein, but we had to put this ATP dependent protein um, down as well. And that meant that we had to look at the thermodynamics of the um, iron protein and mediate the iron protein. So we switched um, from using cobaltocene, cobaltocinium as a mediator to methylvaeolagen as a mediator um, to, to, to switch those um, potentials. And we were interested if we could um, essentially get an anode to do nitrogen or a cathode, sorry, to do nitrogen reduction to ammonia um, and marry that to an anode um, that would do hydrogen oxidation and kind of do the overall Haber-Bosch um, reaction, but um, not at high temperature and high pr pressure, but in an electrochemical cell. So the first step um, was to um, look at whether or not we could get that cathode to function. There's the methylvaeolagen. Um, a reversible peak when nitrogenase is added. Um, we see bioelectric catalysis. If there's no methylvaeolagen, we see no response. So there's no direct electron transfer. Um, we studied this in the presence of um, nitrogen and we're actually then um, able through bulk electrolysis to see ammonia um, being produced and to get pretty decent Faraday efficiencies um, out of this. Um, so once we had that cathode working, it was time to marry that cathode um, to a hydrogenase uh, anode. Uh, and so uh, we reached out to Tony DeLacy's group um, in Spain because they had a hydrogenase uh, that could also be mediated by methylvaeolagen. So we have the same mediator on either side. Um, and that meant um, that we could actually generate a fuel cell out of this system uh, where we have a small open circuit potential associated with the, the differences um, in concentration of the oxidized and reduced species of methylvaeolagen in the anode and cathode. Um, but we um, basically have a fuel cell that is driving nitrogen reduction um, to, to ammonia. Uh, at this point, um, that that's interesting, um, but there are other things that you could use um, nitrogenase for. Um, so I want to show you an example of that, another enzyme cascade, but this time um, for um, this time uh, with nitrogenase. Um, and that enzyme cascade is actually to drive a protein called transaminase. Um, so uh, most of you are probably um, familiar um, with chiral amines, since many of our pharmaceuticals, uh, our pharmaceutical candidates and our um, intermediates and products of pharmaceuticals are chiral amines. Um, so there's a lot of chiral amine um, drugs out there. So the pharmaceutical industry um, is interested um, in selectively producing um, chiral amines. Um, and there's a, an enzyme transaminase uh, that has a great chiral recognition mechanism to be able to selectively make um, chiral amines. However, um, that reaction has its equilibrium shifted to reactants instead of shifted um, to products. Um, and so from the perspective of thinking about re reactor design, industry would handle this um, by trying to remove a product um, and make more of a reactant. Uh, so using Le Chatelier's principle, try to drive it more um, to products. Um, so they can do this by adding an alanine regeneration system. So alanine um, dehydrogenase, uh, as well as the, um, the cofactor NADH and ammonia ammonia. Um, but in order to sort of then do this, you have to regenerate this cofactor um, and that requires more expensive um, enzymes. And so, um, so we were really interested if we could do electrochemical cofactor regeneration. Um, so could we regenerate that cofactor electrochemically? And also could we feed in um, ammonia ammonia from nitrogenase? Um, so that we were feeding in a reactant um, at the right rate um, to get this system um, to run. This is a perfect example um, of, of where electrochemistry shines. We're really good. Um, you've used your lithium ion battery. We're really good at driving things far from equilibrium. Um, um, so, so we were interested in sort of whether or not we could do this this time um, for um, looking at um, chiralamine synthesis. So here we have a cascade. Here's the protein that we're really trying to drive, transaminase, uh, to, to take prochiral ketones um, to chiral amines. Um, we're adding the alanine regeneration system, but this time rather than it being a, uh, a biological system, entirely biological system, we're adding um, nitrogenase and diaphorase. The nitrogenase is going to um, 
pr produce the reactant ammonia ammonium, the diaphorase is going to do cofactor regeneration um, to regenerate um, the NADH. Um, in this case, Anytime we do a, a series of, uh, of cascades, we need to have one mediator in there that drives everything. Um, so we knew methyl thiolagen mediated nitrogenase. We wanted to see if it mediated um, diaphorase. So we looked at methyl thiolagen by itself, methyl thiolagen with nitrogenase uh, in the pink. And then when we add the diaphorase uh, and the cofactor, um, we see a, an enhancement. So it does indeed um, do, um, methyl thiolagen mediates both of the, the proteins. At that point, uh, we can do uh, amperometry and you can see from the area under the curves here that we are able to produce substantially more product, um, drive it substantially farther from equilibrium with the nitrogenase present um, than with it um, absence, absent. Uh, and so we've looked at a whole series of different um, prochiral ketones um, and shown that we can, with great um, selectivity, um, produce um, the chiral amines of interest. Um, so as we sort of think about this um, with nitrogenase, um, we have to really think about um, oh, the overall system and sort of what makes sense <laughs> in terms of the overall system. So nitrogenase is a really cool enzyme. We were um, able to sort of, you know, interface it and do mediated electron transfer, but we had to have both this um, catalytically active protein, as well as this ATP um, dependent protein. And so, um, so as we started to kind of work with industry and they're like, ah, um, you're trying to make a product, uh, ammonia that sells for a few hundred dollars a ton, sells a little bit more, you know, post COVID than this, but, um, but, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars a ton and you're feeding it ATP and ATP is super expensive. Um, and so, you know, that's cost prohibitive. Um, so, so having that, um, that um, ATP there is problematic. Um, the biochemist would say, okay, you can add an ATP regeneration system. That means adding more proteins, more enzymes, uh, as well as uh, sacrificial substrates. Those guys cost money too. Um, and so really, you know, although we've been able to get this two um, protein system to communicate with the electrode surface, there's no way that you could actually um, use this um, for an application because it is ATP um, dependent. And so you need to work with ATP independent systems. Um, and so, you know, as we started to, to, to think about this, um, and we had a, a bunch of group meetings because this is not the only enzyme that's ATP, um, that is ATP dependent. Uh, it's not the only sort of challenge um, in terms of, you know, interfacing um, enzymes with electrode surfaces um, that, that has this sort of ATP um, issue. Um, we started to sit down in the group meeting and talk about the different ways that you could um, interface um, a, a catalyst with an electrode surface at, and make it uh, ATP independent. Um, and my group is pretty diverse. Um, so we we typically have um, some some biochemists, um, some electrochemists, um, some engineers. Um, and as everyone's sitting uh, sitting down and, and chatting about this, there was definitely two different philosophies. Um, so there was uh, a group whose philosophy was. Um, it is a materials issue that we need to take this protein and interface this protein directly with the electrode surface. Um, we need to get direct electron transfer of this protein with the electrode surface, and that's the only way that this can happen. Um, we have to eliminate this ATP dependent protein um, entirely, um, do um, you know direct electron transfer, and we can get this system um, to function. The other half of the um, house, uh, so to speak, was like, you're missing the fact um, that uh, if you have a whole living organism, the whole living organism is going to produce its own ATP, regenerate its own ATP. You need to move to a cellular environment and not an isolated protein environment, and that's the solution. Um, and so like any um, good uh, faculty member, um, the answer to this was to let both of them um, go both of their directions um, and wait and watch and see. 
So I'm going to tell you the story of uh, what happened uh, with the wait and watch uh, on this particular project. Um, so if we look at the biochemists, uh, the biochemists were like, this is a perfect opportunity for us to use uh, synthetic biology um, to um, solve this problem. Um, and so they're like, if we take a, a cyanobacteria, a photosynthetic organism that is going to um, produce and regenerate its own ATP, um, we just need to use synthetic biology to put the machinery into the microorganism to do to make nitrogenase two. So taking a microorganism that already does the ATP uh, regeneration, um, we're going to genetically engineer it um, to do nitrogen reduction to ammonia by putting the nit nitrogenase, uh, the genes for nitrogenase um, into it. Um, so that was the first strategy. Um, that's a relatively challenging strategy because if you look at the NIF genes, the genes responsible for um, biosynthesis of nitrogenase, they're huge. Um, so we had to look through all of these genes and find the smallest, uh, actually, I think this might be like the second small, we had to find a, uh, a small as possible um, gene um, to, uh, to um, put into this uh, microorganism. And we had to choose a good microorganism. Um, and so we ended up choosing Synecococci longatus, uh, mainly because it has a small genome size. The genome is known. It is pretty easy um, to transform it. Um, so to do synthetic biology on it, we can, and we can engineer it um, quite um, easily. So it was a good place. It was a good research model um, for us to start with. Um, so, so at that point, we had selected as small as possible of a uh, NIF gene cluster to make nitrogenase. We constructed a plasmid out of that. We transformed that um, in the cells so that they could produce nitrogenase. And we decided to look at whether or not they did ammonia production. And so if we look at this here, um, we have uh, you know, uh, a methylviolation all by itself. We have our engineered strain, we have the non-engineered strain or uh, the engineered strain that's been denatured. And you can see that there's a small amount of bioelectric catalysis, but there's not a huge response here. Um, and the reason that there's not a huge response there um, is that this is a photosynthetic organism. So it, it, it does this ATP regeneration um, quite well. Um, but it's also um, generating oxygen through photosynthesis, and that oxygen through photosynthesis uh, is problematic to nitrogenase because nitrogenase uh, is um, a, a very oxygen-sensitive um, protein. So what we ended up having to do is actually add a inhibitor, a photosystem, um, uh, photosystem 2 inhibitor, DCMU, um, to this system so that we could inhibit the production of oxygen um, so that uh, that we didn't have too much oxygen um, present. And when we did that, you can see that we have much um, higher um, responses associated um, with the um, with the uh, the nitrogenase bioelectric catalysis. Um, we, at this point, um, still have a mediator. So this is still mediated by methylviologin and methylviologin does cross the, the cell membrane. Um, so there, there's not problems um, with, with that. Um, but as we started to look at this, we're like, oh, this is beautiful. It's beautiful bioelectric catalysis. But then you start to look at um, product quantification. Um, and at this point, we were starting to look at product um, quantification um, through a series uh, of different uh, detection assays. Um, and there are detection assays out there um, that uh, are UV-Vis detection assays, detection assays out there with fluorescence. But regardless of, of what you do in this um, situation, because you have a biological system, you're going to have a high ammonia ammonium background. So here's the strain that is not electrochemically um, producing ammonia ammonia in the uh, sort of lighter green. Um, and here's the one with the nitrogenase um, that is doing nitrogen reduction to ammonia. You can see the background is extremely high associated with the, the biological system. Um, so this is a perfect example where if you just did, you didn't do the control experiment and you just did the dark green bars, you would be like, we're producing ammonia, yay, this is fantastic. Um, but if you do the control with the strain that doesn't have nitrogenase, um, you have a, a large amount of production, and sometimes it's not a detectable uh, amount of uh, ammonia that's being um, produced uh, from the NIF strain compared to what is present in the, the, the biological system. And so this meant we really had to take it to the next step um, to actually 
um, detect um, that uh, that uh, ammonia. Um, and unfortunately, the next step is an expensive assay. Um, so we had to, to move um, to uh, an assay where we used um, N15 uh, labeled nitrogen gas to make N15 ammonia ammonium and then detect it with NMR. Um, and we can detect and quantify that um, and kind of separate the background chemistry that is going to be N14 uh, ammonia ammonium um, from that biological background from the actual nitrogen reduction to ammonia chemistry that um, will be the N15 chemistry. This works out quite well. Um, you can see um, that we are not as high in pyridate efficiency with a mediated system um, here. So mediation is not um, as ideal for this um, particular system, but you can see that we are indeed um, producing um, quite a bit of uh, ammonia ammonia. Uh, in order to kind of increase this Faraday efficiency, we really want to increase the, the um, efficiency. So we want to uh, sort of move from a mediated system where we have to wait for this methyl valogen to cross the cell membrane, react with the nitrogenase, cross back, um, react with the electron. So there's some serious transport limitations um, in this mediated electron transfer. So to improve it, we then wanted to see if we can move to direct electron transfer and move to a, a, a um, a, a microorganism that we would now genetically engineer to be able to communicate with an electrode and not have to have a mediator um, there. Um, we went to the literature to look at um, the... Ah, there. Uh, we went to the literature to look at natural exoelectrogens, so natural um, microorganisms like Geobacter and Schuonella that directly communicate with the electrode, looked at their chemistry um, and looked at whether or not we could easily put that into um, cyanobacteria and decided to um, choose uh, the chemistry um, that makes Geobacter communicate with the electrode surface. It's an outer membrane cytochrome, um, and it's that outer membrane cytochrome that has been put into um, cyanobacteria before for solar cell applications. Um, and so we thought, okay, we've already engineered the nitrogenase in there. Maybe we can um, add this uh, membrane cytochrome. Um, so now we can do direct electron transfer. So this time we did a chromosomal integration of the OMCS um, into the previous strain with the hope that then it could do direct electron transfer. Um, we went and made sure that uh, after we transformed it, it does indeed um, um, produce the OMCS. Uh, we did uh, electrochemical impedance uh, and uh, cyclic voltammetry um, to show that uh, there is communication. Uh, and then we started looking at whether or not uh, we could uh, indeed um, produce ammonia. So here is uh, with the mediator, um, here is the direct electron transfer. So you can see we have higher current densities. We also have higher Faraday efficiencies. Um, and higher ammonia accumulation. So, so that direct electron transfer um, does work in this case. And the whole living, uh, not sure what my computer is doing. We'll give it a second. The whole living microorganism um, is, you know, able to um, do the nitrogen reduction to ammonia, have the ATP, ADP um, working well. So that was the biologist. Um, sort of strategy to how to get rid of ATP. I, I told you that the electric chemists were like, it's all about making a material so that you can do direct electron transfer. Biology is not going to solve your problem. It is materials electric chemistry that's going to solve your problem. And all we need to do is direct electron transfer. And so um, David Hickey, um, who um, was a postdoc in the group, um, who's now a, a faculty member at Michigan State University, um, developed this really cool polymer to promote direct electron transfer. So this polymer has a linear polyethylene um, backbone um, that is, uh, the backbone is functionalized with pyrenes. Pyrenes will pi pi stack to carbon electrodes. Um, so this helps um, to be kind of a glue um, to, uh, to hold the nitrogenase onto the electrode surface. But the uh, nitrogenase also likes a very hydrophobic environment. So that pyrene helps the hydrophobic environment to get the right orientation to promote direct electron transfer. So in this case, we can take this polymer that um, David made, we can take the enzymes, some carbon nanotubes, uh, some crosslinker, crosslink it all on the electrode surface, do a little bit of um, cyclic voltammetry, this time in the absence of uh, nitrogen and in the presence of nitrogen, and you can see a response. Um, we're able to sort of um, detect the ammonia, ammonia production, 
If we go back and do square wave voltammetry, um, we can see both um, um, sort of uh, metallo um, components of the, the, um, the catalytically active enzyme. So we can see that cofactor um, as well as the um, uh, as well as the um, P cluster, and we can determine the potentials of those. This has been great fun um, because uh, it turns out that for biochemists to figure out um, potentials of uh, the, the cofactors in their enzymes is a bit challenging. Um, for them, um, a pain for them. Um, and so Oliver Enzel and Lance both gave us a series of mutants um, so that we could show um, that um, as the metal changed in the cofactor or as you mutated around the cofactor that you could change um, the potential. It also gave us an opportunity um, to do some um, chemistry that they weren't able to do. They can only do assays with that iron protein, that ATP dependent protein present, and we're able to do it without. Um, and so we're able to show that um, um, when we do with and without, um, that one of the roles of that iron protein is actually to shift the potential of the cofactor um, to a higher value. Uh, we also, um, because we can study without the iron protein, we can study um, inhibitors. Um, and so uh, it turns out that the iron protein actually um, prevents hydrogen inhibition. Um, so. So this has been fun because it has allowed us um, from an electrochemistry perspective to have a new tool um, to help the biochemists look at uh, mechanism, but it's also allowed us to look at you know, kinetics and, and efficiency um, and actually figure out sort of what are those ideal potentials that you would have to apply to not have hydrogen evolution um, since the enzyme is inhibited um, by hydrogen, um, but still have the nitrogen um, reduction to ammonia. So hopefully in the last hour and 15 minutes, um, I've showed you um, that we can do both direct electron transfer and mediated electron transfer on both enzyme systems as catalysts, as well as whole living organisms as catalysts um, for a wide variety of applications from kind of mechanistic uh, sort of fundamental enzymology uh, to um, uh, energy applications and synthesis applications. Um, and with that, um, I would like to thank the funding agencies, uh, the collaborators, uh, my research group who did everything that I showed you because I'm just the, the talking head, um, you guys for being a, a patient audience, um, and I look forward, looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Shelley. It was an amazing talk. It's really a lot of, a lot of new things that we haven't heard here yet of. So we're open to questions and uh, the audience can ask directly. You can also direct, in, uh, you can ask in a, in a chat. Um, and maybe, um, maybe I can start. If you can open your presentation, I'm really sorry, if you can go back to your um, presentation, to one of the last slides where you show the enzymes on, uh, on a, directly on an electrode. Yeah, I guess a couple of slides back. Um, yeah, for example, here, it's, this one is good. So, I mean, it might be a bit of a naive question, but I, I think it's important for the educational purposes. So when, we, when I look at this enzyme, is it, is it correct to say that I can view it as a, an insulating particle? It's got extremely small nanoparticle, but insulating where you have a redox center, there is no way you can have conductive pathways through. So ion, it's not ionically conducting, it's not electronically conducting, only tunneling can happen. So yes, um, but if you look at the system, you know, this is both of the proteins together, you have sort of multiple metal centers that, um, that it can, exchange, it can transfer electrons with. Um, so, so there is sort of internal electron transfer that can happen, mm -hmm. but the the sort of peptide core is an insulator. Um, so you really need to tunnel electrons through that peptide core unless you put something in. Like, so, so there's a number of researchers who've been putting like, you know, metal nanoparticles or, um, or organometallic complexes or, or things in that peptide structure um that's really challenging to do like if as you start to to um engineer that protein that structure that internal structure you frequently denature the protein but um but as it is you would think of it as an insulating core okay but in so in this case the the next question which is related to this is um 
how do you see the, the role of the double layer? So if it's an insulator and core, the double layer, so you have a potential drop then across the insulator and the electrochemical double layer where you have um, electrons and ions on both sides or holes and ions on both sides is on the right side from the enzyme, right? On this figure. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. and so, I'm just so that would be true. Uh -huh. So that would be true in direct electron transfer. So mediated exactly. electron transfer is a little bit different, right? Because now we are in mediated electron transfer. We oftentimes have a film that's microns, you know, long. Um, um, and so, so you have protein dispersed all the way through it. Uh -huh. um, but in this case, you are you're immobilizing the protein directly um, on the electrode. So, so you're going to have, you know, ions. Etc. You know, all around here. So. Okay. 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 Um, we have a question from uh, Nicholas. Please go ahead. Hi, Shelley. Really, really nice. Thank you. I would like to continue also with this ammonia production, but with the, the biological system with the wall cells on the on the electron. If you would just go back to the slides, it would help me to to ask. Which slide? The one where you have the the wall cell that is um. Um, um, photosynthetic cells that are generating the ATP. This yes, one? something like this. That's perfect. So I like really your solution to turn off the, the, the water splitting to have no more oxygen so that you have the electrons coming from the electron and still the ATP regenerated. What I don't fully understand is before you do that, you have this methyl biogen as the mediator, maybe a, a few slides back, where you do not see any oxygen reduction and only when you turn off the the water splitting, where you turn off the oxygen production, then you see a catalytic wave, which then of course makes sense to be ammonia production. But can you explain why you observe absolutely no oxygen before now? Yeah, um, so, so you have a situation, um, we have sort of internal and external Mm. Um, uh, oxygen, right? Um, so, so when we prepare the the, the system um, initially, we're seeing that the external, um, you know, that there's no external dissolved oxygen, but there's still sort of oxygen that's being produced inside of the the, the microorganism. Um, and I think you know what you're seeing is just the the um, length of time it takes, the fact that the methylvalogen can react with that dissolved oxygen inside of the cell. Um, you're sort of, you know, seeing a long time for that to get to the electrode surface, so to speak. Okay, so it's a time delay that is, or the oxygen, uh, time delay. oxygen yeah. is consumed within the cell before the electrode is, is reducing any of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, can I? Yes, yeah. uh, thank you for the nice talk, Akluruk. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is the stability of the, this kind of performing system. How long does it continue to produce ammonia for this bio uh, electrocatalyst? Yes, um, so, so I guess we're talking about several different systems here, right? A mediated mm -hmm. system, a direct electron yes. transfer system, um, and the, the sort of whole living organism. Um, we haven't focused so much um, on making, um, you know, making materials for sort of long-term um, stability. We work with a, a company um, and I think that they've looked at a couple of weeks of stability. Um, so, so some stability, um, but um, my guess is um, that, um, that we we are seeing degradation over that um, sort of two week um, period. So, um, so I would say that you're probably talking kind of ten wait ten days to a couple of weeks with the enzyme system. Um, mm -hmm. Could that be improved? Yes, obviously um, you can spend a lot of time um, immobilizing enzymes uh, on electrode surfaces to make them um, stable for longer. The microbial system um, becomes a really complicated system, um, and you know people will say that microbial bioelectrochemistry has the advantage of having very long term stability. Like there's examples of people using microbes in, in microbial fuel cells for three to five years. Um, where the cells are growing, reproducing, growing, reproducing, um, and, and all is um, and all continues to function. In this case, um, when we're adding that inhibitor, 
um, we have to 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 you know be very careful. Um, so so what we're typically doing is going through a time um, um, path. Um, where we inhibit photosynthesis and we let photosynthesis happen um, to allow the cell to, to, to grow and reproduce. Um, and then we inhibit again, do nitrogen reduction to ammonia. Um, so, so it's a bit more challenging in this system um, for, in, in a lot of ways, the cyanobacteria uh, the cyanobacteria was not maybe um, the best model system um, for, for that aspect, um, but it is a beautiful model system to be able to do the genetic engineering. So biologically, um, it was a good choice. Electrochemically, it may not have been the best choice. Yes, um, I just quick uh, second question is about the pronto ligand uh, inhibits the pronto. I think this is wonderful for, for the uh, nature, but uh, could you give some uh, comment uh, or from material point of view, what kind of insight from we can learn from this proton ligand uh, to maybe design our memory or materials similar behavior like this? Yeah, so, so you know, I think the things that you learn from, from biology um, is just how important that second coordination sphere is. Um, in terms of designing um, catalysts. Um, so obviously, you know, that becomes uh, a, a huge um, challenge as you start to, to, to think about um, biomimics. Um, it also, though, you know, in the case of like looking at the iron protein, um, you really see that that iron protein serves a purpose but electrochemically, we got the reaction to happen without the iron protein. Um, so it serves a purpose biologically um, in, in terms of protecting the protein um, that is not 100% necessary. Um, so, so, so if you think about a biological system, uh, things to be at a, you know, biology likes to do things at kind of moderate potentials and not extreme potentials. And so, um, so it has to put a lot of uh, sort of engineering into the system um, to be able to operate at extreme um, potentials. And so that's a perfect case of something where that iron protein biologically is super important, um, but we're able to um, you know, we're able to handle it uh, from the electrochemistry perspective and do the chemistry even without it. Um, we do have to realize, though, that uh, that proton reduction um, to, to hydrogen, too much of that is a bad thing. Um, and so thinking about sort of electrode surfaces that aren't going to generate, um, that aren't going to do pro uh, proton reduction um, helps us even more. So. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, hi, thank you, Dr. Mintier, for such a fantastic talk. Um, I do I have a question about the actually this uh, current slide right here. This is perfect. Um, so the cyanobacteria that you um, incorporated the OMCS protein into it, uh, did you functionalize the electrode or add a polymer to the electrode to help it grow as a biofilm or did you just let it grow on its own? Uh, and then a second part to that is, does the machinery of the OMCS protein allow for intracellular electron transfer? or is it only an extracellular uh, protein? Um, I would say that the, the second question, we don't know the answer to. We, we know it's helping extracellular um, electron transfer. We don't know if it's um, helping intracellular. Um, the fastest way to make an electrode um, is to uh, immobilize cyanobacteria um, in a hydrogel uh, and immobilize the hydrogel on the electrode surface. Um, the biofilm will form, um, but obviously that takes time. Um, so, so, so it kind of depends on on whether or not you want to study the natural um, biofilm, whether you want to promote nitro, uh, what, whether you want to promote um, biofilm formation, um, so that um, you can do experiments faster, I guess. And then for the hydrogel, do you have like a specific hydrogel that you use or is it tailored to this bacteria? It's tailored. Um, so so uh, we love hydrogels. Um, so so we work with, you know, linear polyethylene, I mean, um, PVP, um, you know, chitazans, alginates, et cetera. Um, but, but we just choose a hydrogel that's appropriate for, for the particular application. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Shelly, maybe I can ask a few more questions uh, if the audience is still waiting. Um, so if somebody has questions, please go ahead. But, uh, a few. First is I'm, I'm curious about the redox of enzymes. So 
do you, because it's a big molecule, so one would expect that electrochemistry can restrict sort of the, the so the range of potentials would be really small because of electrochemical effects as well, not just chemical. So do you have to worry a lot about this in, in real experiments? Like, do you have to first study what is the range of potentials where enzyme does not degrade, does not change or reshape itself? Yeah, so, so first and foremost, um, we uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the the appropriate electrode. Um, so mm. so first and foremost, you have to be able to have a, an electrode material that is not going to denature your protein. Um, and so before we kind of you know sort of study um, the potential window, um, because that is dependent to you know on the on the electrode um, system. Uh, then we have to sort of find an electrode um, that, that that works there, um, and, and so that's you know different for every. Um, that's different for different proteins. Uh, if a protein is membrane bound, not membrane bound, positively charged, negatively charged, uh, you know, likes hydrophobic environments, doesn't like hydrophobic environments, etc. So the first step is really to find an electrode material, then to look at your window, then to look at the chemistry that you. <laughs> may or may not be able to do in that window. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I'm also curious about your opinion uh, about a lot of work that is published where people are trying to mimic enzymes in inorganic materials. So they can take a cofactor and trying to say make some fragments of it in some other materials or make it nanoparticles, these nanozymes, etc. So how, in principle, how how feasible is it if we would like to really mimic it in in an inorganic way less of a biochemical yeah so so one of the things that i think you have to, to think about in a biochemical environment um, is that these are soft materials um, and that they frequently undergo a structural change during um during catalysis so um so you know when I was talking about sort of making electrodes and adding crosslinker, if you add too much crosslinker, you lose the activity of your protein um, because you change its degrees of freedom, and now it cannot do the catalysis um, that that it wants to do. Um, and so if you look at a lot of the the, the systems um, that are out there that are mimicking, um, I think we're getting better at mimicking catalytic active sites. Uh, we're getting better at thinking about the secondary um, sphere. Uh, we're not thinking about the fact that this is a soft material and it, it has to, to to be able to do the, the catalysis. So, so that aspect, I think, um, is still something that um, um, I think people in the molecular electrocatalysis community uh, are, are thinking about, but that hasn't sort of translated itself to, to the sort of heterogeneous catalysis community um, as much as it will need to, to, to really... Um, um, to, to really function. I mean, I, I think some of the systems, like um, some of the things that we are starting to introduce is the selectivity of the catalytic active site in terms of shape, right? So um, Alex Kuhn and his group, you know, they've been doing um, basically making metal um, surfaces that are imprinted um, with, uh, you know, with the with the catalytic active site um, so that they get selectivity. Um, so that's making a step towards that, but then that's still sort of the solid material and you're gonna have to think about um, the fact that the protein really is a, a soft material that, that um, uses that to its advantage in a lot of systems. Right, so you think that getting rid of it is pretty much unfeasible if you want to have enzyme level activities in inorganic systems. Yep. Okay. Um, you also discuss partly the synthetic biology. So the question that I'll ask you may be a bit, again, a bit naive, but I think it's, I'm curious about the future, how you see it. Um, do you see any sort of interface, possible interface in the future between directed evolution of enzymes and electrochemistry? So when we can direct the evolution in a way that it would help enzymes work better for direct electron transfers for um, say electrochemical experiments there is any way yeah. I, I i don't know the state of the art in direct evolution field these days it's exploding but maybe you know better of course so maybe you yeah have so, so 
perspective? So directed evolution um, is only as good as your screen, whatever your assay is, right? right. Um, and, and so that becomes, I, I think, what has become um, the challenge. Um, people have done directed evolution to make the enzyme, say, more selective or more active, um, things that were not sort of to make it more electrochemically viable, but to make it have other properties that they could assay for. The challenge um, in saying, okay, I wanna do directed evolution to promote direct electron transfer, as an example, um, is how you come up with an assay um, to do that. Um, so DropSense uh, has a 96 well plate uh, sort of uh, electrochemical reader, um, but that is a situation um, that um, is still, um, Still, you're still challenged by throughput um, because the way that most assays work in directed evolution is on the whole organism itself or the cell lysate. Um, and cell lysate, if I put cell lysate down on an electrode surface, um, mm. I can passivate my electrode beautifully, but seeing the protein of interest in there um, is really, really um, difficult. So, so right now we don't have a great um, assay strategy without purifying the protein to some extent and then putting it into a 96 well electrochemical plate reader. Um, and that's the, the throughput of the purification is just not there at this point. Right, so. but you think it, it might be quite promising and somebody comes up with a great idea of how to do it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think what is probably, you know, probably a, a lower hanging fruit uh, at this point is is taking um, and designing proteins. You know, I talked about that interdomain strategy of, of sort of adding uh, components to, to the protein. Um, if you do that experimentally, most of the protein gets denatured. Um, and I think you you definitely have the possibility then um, to, you know, use computational strategies, things like Rosetta, to predict what proteins will be stable and kind of do more site-directed mutagenesis than directed evolution. I see. Yeah, that's it's quite advanced. So um, maybe along those lines, the question that I would ask is about the nanoelectrochemistry, since you touched a little bit upon that. So I, uh, we part, in part, we discussed it with Andrew Eving previously. Um, the question is, so there's a, a lot of people are studying neuroelectrochemistry and they, they do the, um, they, they're trying to control the, um, the neural circuits from, or at least read, do the readout from the computer, say the ideally brain computer interfacing. And on the other side, there's a lot of um, bioelectrochemistry, but in between there's a big gap because it's, it's very different levels of sort of analysis that you do. So on the bioelectrochemistry, from what I see, people usually look at the exact molecule specific um, enzymes, et cetera. But on the neuro side, you have a, a cell, you have a zoo of everything. So do you see the gap being somewhat slow, getting slowly closed in the future? Or it's, it's so fundamental that there's no way we can bring those somewhat modal systems that we're studying in bioelectrochemistry, bioelectrocatalysis, to the neuroelectrochemistry? when we work with big cells and real systems? Yeah, I think to some extent, you know, bioelectrochemistry over the last decade or so um, has done a lot of work at um, being able to immobilize proteins with strategies that prevent nonspecific absorption and, and allow you to work in more um, real environments. Uh, most of that has been, you know, the community that's studying wearables and implantables, um, where they're sort of energy harvesting and then sensing and whatnot from sweat or, um, you know, implanting and the blood, uh, et cetera. Um, and so I think that, you know, they're making a lot of progress, um, that those strategies will then um, be useful for, for neuroelectrochemistry, um, definitely. So. So I think we're making it there. They've just been like two separate communities for so long that, um, but yeah, if yeah. you look now, you'll see you'll see people in the neuroelectrochemistry community that are putting proteins, that are putting enzymes uh, uh, down on electrode surfaces um, for yeah. for basically mostly um, detecting non-redox active um, species. So. Mm -hmm. 
And would you say that this is the field where this is the direction where all the analytical electrochemistry of proteins is moving into in part? Um, so, so I would say part of the community is is moving there. Part of the community is moving um, to more looking at um, assays where you can um, where you can you know study the sort of fundamental protein um, in a way that spectroscopy can't. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. On my side, I'm done with questions. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Uh, it was a very nice talk, very long discussion. I think we, we all enjoyed it greatly. We still have a pretty big audience, so everyone is, is here. So thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, have a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good evening to those of you in Europe. <laughs> thank you.